I think the important thing to keep in mind about cemeteries is that while they are tributes to the dead, they're really about the living. They're about those who, who want to commemorate something, and they are intended with future generations in mind. We are in, in Hollywood Cemetery, which is located on rolling hills overlooking the James River, just west of what was the Richmond City boundary in 1861. The first burials were in 1849, but Hollywood had a very troubled first decade of its history. It really didn't become the place for white Richmonders to be buried until after 1858, when President James Monroe's body was reinterred here among great fanfare but it remained segregated uh, well into the 20th century. During the Civil War, it became a burial site for Confederates, hundreds and then thousands of Confederate soldiers who died in hospitals and in battle, particularly those who died south and west of the city uh, were interred here. So many were buried that the Confederate government uh, subsidized an expansion of the cemetery and the, it paid a token fee from the Confederate quartermaster to the cemetery uh, for the thousands of burials here. The round figure for the number of Confederate burials here is about 18,000, the majority of whom are unknown. This came to be known as the Confederate Cemetery in the South. The ladies who would establish the monument that you see behind me would refer to this as the Mecca of the South. They thought that all Confederate descendants would one day come and pay respect to their fathers and grandfathers who lay buried in this cemetery. The pyramid was built in 1869. It was established by the Hollywood Memorial Association, who was one of the many ladies' memorial associations that formed in the wake of the Civil War to provide what they considered honorable Christian burials for Confederate soldiers because the United States government was not going to do that. The first Confederate monuments appeared in cemeteries and not only is it emblematic of the dead, a, a pyramid structure if you think about ancient Egypt and the, the tombs, but this was also a very cost-effective way to build a memorial. When the ladies were thinking about how they might honor all of the, the dead, eventually 18,000 Confederates who would, would rest in the cemetery. They went to a man named Charles Dimmock, who had been responsible, had been an engineer who had built the fortifications around Richmond. He said, let's create a pyramid and we'll carve it from James River granite. And that pyramid will be about 90 feet in height. It will be the center of the Confederate section. It'll be the first thing people see when they come in the cemetery. And he said, not only will the granite again, carved from the, the James River, will that represent the, the steadfast and loyalty of Confederate soldiers? But he also envisioned ivy and rose tendrils growing up the side of the monument, which he said would be emblematic of women's devotion. So he had all sorts of, of symbolism that he attached to this monument. The, the monument would become the symbol of Hollywood Memorial Association would be on the front of their Confederate Register of Dead, which was a listing of all of those thousands of Confederate soldiers buried here in the cemetery. So the earliest Confederate monuments were almost always, there are a few exceptions, but almost always they were erected in cemeteries because they were mourning statuary. Their intent was to, to be a tribute to those who had fallen in the war, not to veterans, but to those who had given their life during the war. And we see this in obelisks in cemeteries, uh, and we really don't see the type of statuary monumentation, at least full-blown statues the way we think about the Lee Monument that was in Richmond. Those are dedicated in the 1890s and into the early 1900s when we start to see them move from mourning spaces into much more public spaces where they are claiming that space, whether it's on a courthouse lawn or a grand boulevard such as Monument Avenue, that we start to see the shift from mourning, which we might expect, we should expect in the immediate aftermath of the war, to the more celebratory monuments that we find 30, 40, even 50 years later.
there were some Confederate generals who were buried here during the war. By far the most famous of them was Major General James Ewell Brown Stewart, Jeb Stewart, who was the commander of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia Cavalry Corps. He was buried rather hurriedly. There was continued fighting. It was a crisis for uh, the Confederate arms around Richmond, so he was buried without ceremony. The location of the grave was referred to as, as rather obscure, and in the subsequent years, the Hollywood offered a grave site at a newly opened location called Chapel Hill, and Stewart was moved there in May of 1876. So in other words, Jeb Stewart is not buried in the Confederate section, or even in close proximity to it, as is uh, General George Pickett. In the 19th century, mourning had been largely the responsibility of women. And so they turned to women to coordinate and organize efforts to raise funds for reburial efforts. But in May of 1866, the Hollywood Memorial Association made its effort to establish a Memorial Day. And they selected May 31st as the first day that Richmond had heard the guns of war in 1861. And before that day, they ask that local volunteers, men, boys, come out and remound and turf the graves. The women would be responsible for uh, floral bouquets, for decorating the graves. And on that first Memorial Day, and there were lots of different Memorial Days throughout the South, thousands of former Confederates would gather in some central location. They would come to the cemetery where women and girls would decorate the graves with floral tributes. There would be a, a dirge or two, a song, and then there would be some sort of speech, an oration. And often these orations were condemning Reconstruction, condemning the federal government. So these are not celebratory. These are not efforts of reconciliation. These are very much days of defending the Confederacy. So we see the first vestiges of the lost cause really taking root in these days of mourning. And I should point out that, that women were largely responsible for Memorial Days in the Confederacy. And this was very much a, a thoughtful, concerted act. This was the notion that women were in charge of mourning and therefore their actions could not be treasonous. But Northerners recognized what they were doing. They recognized that they were planting the seeds of rebellion. The Chicago Tribune, for example, denounced the Women of Hollywood Memorial Association for sowing the seeds of treason by placing flowers on, on their dead in, in the cemetery. So this is a, absolutely a way in which they are both using mourning, using gender to, to insulate, to protect this Confederate memory, and it absolutely has political connotations. In the years after the Civil War, even as Ladies Memorial Associations were establishing Confederate cemeteries throughout the former Confederacy, former Confederates grew increasingly frustrated that there were many of their dead at, still at Gettysburg and Antietam. And Gettysburg in particular riled former Confederates. They knew that there was this beautiful national cemetery there. They knew that Samuel Weaver had been responsible for reinterring, for, for digging up the Union dead and placing them in the national cemetery in 1863 and 1864. And so in about 1869, there were concerted calls to remove the Confederate dead from Gettysburg so that they weren't resting on enemy soil. So again, this is not reconciliation. This is absolutely a way of protecting the Confederate memory. So in 1871, the Southern Opinion, which was absolutely a lost cause newspaper that was based here in Richmond, called on the women of the South to protect their dead that were still lying in these enemy territories. And so they asked different ladies' memorial associations throughout the South if they would be responsible for paying to have Confederate soldiers removed to their respective cemeteries. So a group of women in Raleigh, North Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina, a handful of other places step up. And Hollywood Cemetery was the most successful memorial association, the wealthiest in terms of the, the members themselves and the memorial association itself. And so in 1870, 1871, they agreed to take on this project. Over the course of the next couple of years, beginning in 1872, 
the Confederate dead would begin arriving here in Richmond. Over the next couple of years, eventually almost 3,000 Confederate dead from Gettysburg were placed here in Hollywood. And I should point out, these weren't just dead from Virginia. The ladies thought that this was a national Confederate cemetery and they agreed to take on Confederate dead from, from whatever state they were from. This is, is really, Hollywood becomes, especially in that moment, the national Confederate cemetery. In December of 1889, the Confederacy's only president, Jefferson Davis, uh, died in New Orleans, Louisiana. It was buried in, the, in a tomb of Confederate soldiers at Metairie Cemetery. But it was widely understood that that was only a temporary expedient. He had been in New Orleans when he died, but he wasn't going to remain in New Orleans. So essentially a sweepstakes began uh, for the body of Jefferson Davis. But Richmond had something of a competitive advantage over other cities. And to understand that, we have to go back 25 years earlier. Uh, Davis's son, Joseph, Joseph Evan Davis, a five-year-old son, fell from the portico of the White House of the Confederacy and was killed by that fall in April of 1864. And on May 2nd, his body was interred here at Hollywood Cemetery. The Hollywood Cemetery Corporation, the newly established Jefferson Davis Monument Association, and the leaders of the city of Richmond wrote to Verena Davis, the widow, asking her to inter Davis here from New Orleans and offering a grave site for not only for Jefferson Davis, but for enti her entire family. And while, although Verena did not want to commit so soon after Davis's death, it was pretty clear that Richmond was going to win this, this sweepstakes based on the presence of Joseph's grave and on the promise to reunite the family in death. George E. Pickett, famed for his uh, charge at Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863, died in 1875, so 10 years after the war, in Norfolk, Virginia. His body was moved here to Hollywood Cemetery, an elaborate uh, funeral procession that occurred. And in 1888, a monument was placed over his grave. What's really interesting about this monument is that it was originally intended to be placed on the battlefield at Gettysburg. But the Union veterans and other members of the, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association absolutely refused to have a Confederate monument on that part of the battlefield. Um, and for, for many years, they refused to have any Confederate monuments at Gettysburg. It was a Union Memorial Park. So the next best option they decided was to, to dedicate that monument here over his grave in 1888. Tellingly, his widow, who survived him until 1931, would spend most of her life trying to rehabilitate his, his image, LaSalle Pickett, LaSalle Corbell Pickett. And she became known as the widow of George Pickett. That was her identity. She became a, a minor celebrity. She flew in planes across the country. She gave lectures. She was always um, uh, featured at lyceums and, and other great events and incredibly famous at her death in 1931, so much that her obituary appeared in newspapers across the country. And her, one of her, her grandsons thought that the most fitting place for her burial would be beside her soldier, as she called him, beside George Pickett. But the ladies of Hollywood Memorial Association said absolutely not. They did not want to set the precedent of widows being buried next to their, their husbands. And so they refused to have her be buried here in the cemetery. Uh, this caused such an uproar that members of the family actually discussed the possibility of disinterring George Pickett and burying both of them together somewhere. Um, ultimately, LaSalle Pickett, her ashes were, were placed in a small memorial chapel outside of Arlington National Cemetery. But in 1998, the Virginia Division of the United Daughters of the Confederacy decided that in fact it did make sense that Sally Pickett, as she was originally known, that Sally Pickett should be placed next to her husband. So in 1998, her ashes were removed from that mausoleum in Arlington, or in Arlington, Virginia, and placed here next to her husband. Again, a huge tribute. There was a fife and drum corps. There were Confederate flags. 
and a, a, a real turnabout in the way in which LaSalle Pickett would be commemorated. And thinking about the central role of women, women had had always been instrumental. They had been at the forefront and yet they had tried to take a back seat to the veterans and, and tried to kind of demure, if you will. But here we find them really kind of claiming that stand. And so we, we think about in the 1990s that, that effort to reclaim LaSalle Pickett as, as one of their own. Cemeteries were meant, as Carrie mentioned, for the living as well as for the dead. So it has multiple layers of both history, but also of the human presence. 